Welcome to the interview series of One Week Critique. Uh, this week, we are joined by writer Mark Lagner. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Matt. Thank you. Glad to be here. You bet. So you do all kinds of writing. You write poetry. You write short stories, nonfiction. You write for film. Uh, maybe you could just start us off with uh, a little bit of what your writing life looks like. OK. Um, well, I work from home with my day job as a as a writer of um, you know textbooks and other freelance stuff, and I also teach online. Um, so when I'm not doing that, and uh, when I'm not um, watching my kids, um, I uh, I get up early in the morning, try to beat everybody else awake, so I could get an hour of writing in. That's sort of my own writing. Um, and then once my kids are out of the house and off to daycare or wherever they go for the day, um, if I'm not watching them, um, you know, I'll just write all day and take a lunch break and maybe go for a run after lunch. If it's not too hot. If the weather's really hot, I'll take, you know, I switch my run and my um, writing time. So I'll do a run in the morning, write in the afternoon. But that's really what I do. Um, and I definitely have to put in um, an hour or two a day in order to feel like I'm making good progress and I'm not, um, uh, I'm not I'll, I'll like lose the thread of whatever I'm working on or I'll lose interest or, or something bad will happen, so. So do you find switching between different genres and so forth easy, difficult? Um, you know, how do you choose what particular genre you're gonna write for if it's not on assignment? I, I switched them, I switched between them very easily. I loved switching because I think usually when I switch, it's because I'm tired of whatever I'm working on. And so um, let's say if I'm trying to write, uh, if I'm writing fiction and I, I can only do so much of that, you know, I, I meet my daily word count and I'm burnt out, but I still have an extra hour in the day. It's really kind of fun to switch to another genre and or um, even from fiction just to a screenplay or to uh, a poem, especially. So the more different the switch is, the more I enjoy it because it's like freeing to leave behind the thing that was kind of frustrating me or that I got mentally exhausted on. Um, so I, I use them to refresh and often I will write, you know, I'll write a poem or work on poetry specifically just to refresh my um, bigger, longer project brain, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so today we're gonna talk specifically about a poem uh, that's in your new book, uh, Returning the Sword to the Stone, uh, which is out on uh, phonograph editions. Um, before we get to that, I thought I'd ask, uh, about a specific line you have in a different poem in the book. Uh, from Love is a Waveform, uh, you have the line, every poem is a list. Um, I see that a lot of the poems in your book, um, which is your second and several in your first book, I think could be termed list poems, right? And sure. maybe you're pushing beyond that fact and writing more list poems than the average poet is writing. Um, maybe you can speak to your, the influence that lists have on your writing, um, either in generation or, or putting poems together. Sure, that's, that's great. Um, I'm definitely, I tend to write more list poems than other kinds of poems. And I think it's a function of um, the way I think of lines or images or poetic fragments there, it's way easier for me to just think of individual lines and not try to worry about making them into a whole poem. Um, for years, I would try to write, you know, the classic poem over and over. It would be about, you know, two thirds of a page long and be some sort of meditative lyrical thought or, or um, imagining or story or something. Um, and I would I would always start with a fragment that I actually liked and then I'm like, okay, I got this one thing. I got one line. Now let's make a poem out of it. And I would kind of add to it or add more to the thought or push it further. And it never 
it, it was like, I, I could try that a thousand times and maybe five times out of a thousand get a decent poem that I didn't hate. So eventually I realized that um, I just had, I just wasn't that kind of poet. I was a kind of poet who could think of one thing at a time and that's it. And so once I realized that I would create many, many, many lines and images. And um, then it became the, the poem game for me became how to combine them and arrange them. And it turns out lists are very good at um, simply kind of like nakedly presenting one thing at a time. And um, I have spent, you know, most of my like poetic writing time in my life has been spent trying to figure out how to connect random things together so that in a list so that they feel like they're part of a same thought or a whole. Um, and I could say a lot more that that specific line that you mentioned, every poem is a list. I even think I stole that from somebody and I can't remember. I feel like a friend of mine must have written that in a poem and maybe I stole it because it's I every once in a while I'll come across a line and I'm like, I don't think this one's mine, but I, I really can't. I don't know how to find out. And um, I'm just going to assume that, that I thought of it, but that might be the, the source of that specific line. But I do like it because it's um, it is true. Like literally, every poem is a list, even if you don't intend it to be. It's just a list of words in a certain order or a list of lines. Um, and I think that is kind of helpful to think about sometimes. That um, the kind of mystical definitions we can kind of get trapped in with what a poem is. Like, is it a good poem or not? Is this a poem? Uh, so I like the idea of definitions of poetry that strip, strip it of magic so that it's very concrete and simple. And then from that, trying to build up um, my own version of what a poem might be. I don't know. I'm interested in that, that phrase, strip it of magic. Like, okay, if you strip it of magic, <clears throat> you seem to be interested in magic in, in, in some respects. Um, for example, the second poem is a wizard poem. And while maybe it's not specifically about magic, right? Like there are, I don't know, tendencies to think about the magic within a poem or something. It's true. I do love thinking about poetry as a, and magic. And I like thinking about magic in general from from a, like a mythical perspective and wizards and you know mythology and uh, uh, legends and all that. It's like really part of my imagination that I will always, I, I seem to always enjoy writing or thinking about. Um, but when I say strip it of magic, what I mean is, I guess, I'm, in that sense, I use magic as like the inherited, like unconscious halo we put around poetry that, I, maybe when we're younger, it's what makes us love it because we feel drawn to that mysterious power. Like, oh my gosh, how did these, how did these words have this effect on me? How does this make sense? Even though I don't understand it, I, I, I'm drawn to it. That magic, I think um, if we like fetishize it or we put it on such a high pedestal that um, we feel unable to understand what it is at all, then I think that blocks our, it blocks for me the analytical part of the brain, which is really what uh, a lot of what writing is for me. It's like, I, I wanna take the thing apart and understand what is, the, what is the simplest definition of a poem and how can I write that and make sure I feel like I know what I'm doing there. And then on top of that encrust more layers rather than, um, I felt like when I was younger and was trying to write, you know, that classic two third of a page lyrical meditation, um, it was as if I was trying to enter the building on the 23rd floor and I didn't know anything about floor one. So, and I didn't know anything about floor 100. I was just trying to jump right into the middle and figure it out uh, in the middle. And there's something about a list that is like, you are entering poetry at the basement level that you can possibly enter it at 
all you have to do is write one line that is interesting and then write another line that is interesting and then ask yourself which of these which of these should go first and which should go second and there's something elemental about it that is uh, attractive to me um, and I think I hope that when readers encounter that kind of poetry it's like it's uh, it's more nakedly what like what it's doing is more naked or um, unencrusted perhaps and so I hope people could access it um, even if they don't care about poetry um, but that's I mean, I, I, I don't even know if I believe that part. But that's where I'll end that answer. All right. Well, let's take a look at uh, a first draft of Prism Jugglers, which is the opening poem of the book. Um, the first draft is actually called What We Wore. And I'm going to pull it up here for our viewers to see. All right. Whenever you're ready. Okay, so this is the first draft, or not the first even, but it's an early draft of this poem. What we wore. We wore burlap thongs. We wore bulletproof diapers. We wore denim raincoats. We wore tinfoil negligees. We wore turtleneck cargo shorts onesies. We wore grape skin tube socks. We wore jumper cables as suspenders. We wore bathrobes wrapped around our faces. We wore porcelain corsets. We wore spray on condoms. We sewed cherry tomatoes together with needle and thread and wore them like pearls. We wore bat pelt brassiers. We walked in sandals of cantaloupe rinds. We wore newspaper tiaras. We wore ridicule proof fedoras. We wore solar panel plated samurai armor. We wore sand dollar corsages. We wore pull away full British red coat regalia. We wore rocket packs whose thrusters looked like nostrils. We wore sequined sealskin bodices. We wore glass gloves. We wore glass colored mascara. We wore machine gun nests in our updos. We wore earrings from which swung cherries the size of cannonballs. We wore stovepipe hats that prevented dementia. We wore fishnet eye patches. We wore clown shoes covered in mildew. We wore crowns of thorns that prevented deja vu. All right, thank you. So the majority of that draft doesn't end up in the, in the poem that's published in the book. Um, the only line from that, we walked in sandals of cantaloupe rhymes, that makes it in full is that one. Um, there are certainly images and word combinations that also uh, make the cut. Um, I think you've already explained a little bit about your process, about you know writing one good line, uh, finding another line. Um, but how do you move from a draft stage, uh, such as what we wore, to uh, the final version of this? Okay, so a lot of the drafting is, you know, Another reason why I love list poems is that they keep re revision is a little simpler for me. Like, it or it can it starts off simple. It's just just like is this line good enough? Is is bulletproof diapers interesting enough? Like, maybe it's a little interesting, but it feels as an example. I cut that line because a bulletproof diaper is a crazy idea to me. I think it's funny, but. Um, bulletproof is so dramatic and diapers is so silly and also dramatic in its own ways. It was like, it was too loud. It was too obvious it, um, as a joke uh, almost. So I think a lot of the revisions, um, they were trying to find similar combinations of ridiculous fashion, fashion choices that a we could possibly make. Um, but in more subtle or interesting or complex ways. So, um, I mean, I don't know if the final draft is more subtle or interesting or complex, but I like just reading it now, what we wore the first like five stanzas, they feel really repetitive. I feel like I'm just saying, I feel like you read the first 
stanza and you basically get it. So it's gonna just be hitting you with a hammer for the next five stanzas. And I don't really get uh, a, a cluster of interesting, more emotionally or intellectually interesting things happen until the end, which the ending is similar to my ending. So I kind of kept the ending because I think when I hit that crowns of thorns that prevent deja vu, it finally was like, a, that was the light bulb moment where I was like, oh, that is really uh, true to me. Like we, I think we do wear crowns of things that prevent deja vu. We, we, we anoint ourselves saints. We anoint ourselves some kind of like holy martyr and it prevents us from um, remembering the past times. We've done that and the times that that, you know, fucked up the world or, or ruined everything. So um, that, I feel like once I got to that point, it was kind of like, I uh, just, I want better images in the beginning and I want them to be a little more about the weird ways our fashion reflects our own hypocrisies and stupidities and um, not just silliness, but um, silliness kind of aimed at uh, a hypocrisy of, of a we, which is, you know, me and everyone else I know and, or our, you know, our world or our culture or whatever that means. Um, uh, let me see if I wrote anything else about that. So yeah, finding better images, reflecting on what's dissatisfying about the images I don't like. And another, the last part I would say is that what you don't see in this early draft is this whole bucket of other images that I have on the sidelines that I'm trying to work into poems. And some of them are really my favorite. And so once I kind of figure out what this poem is doing, I can reach into that bucket and find, well, would this ever fit in this? And so I'm trying to like save um, unpublished good lines that don't have a home. And once I know what this poem is doing, I can maybe ask all these other lines I have, could they be at home in this poem? Gotcha. Yeah, my friend uh, has the idea of the orphan notebook uh, where you keep all of those lines, you know? Exactly. So um, I did notice there's a lot of end rhymes uh, in this new book, um, in Prism Jugglers, um, also in the sonnet sequence, Salad on the Wind. Um, a lot of repetition in images and words. Uh, you know, you tend to like velociraptors a lot. Um, you know, and, and, and this, these choices, tend to insist that this work is poetry and not another genre, for example. Um, you know, I think the combination of poetic line and form uh, with this kind of absurdist ethos uh, that you've been talking about, um, it, it rings sweet, um, sometimes sincere notes, um, but it does this thing, I think, where it combines highbrow and lowbrow kind of at the same time. Um, for example, uh, the end of Prism Jugglers, which as you've noted is similar uh, to the uh, What We Wore uh, draft, is our stovepipe hats prevented dementia, our bowling shoes prevented mildew, our clown shoes prevented hubris, our crowns of thorns prevented deja vu. Right, so we've got the obvious rhyme of mildew and boo. Um, and then we have this repetition of prevented, um, except that the prevention comes in these groups of two that are divided, right? We've got the hats and the crown of thorns in the first and fourth lines and footwear in the middle two lines. Um, you know, maybe the world of the poem this prevention doesn't actually happen. Um, it's not successful or, or so to speak. Um, or it is successful, right? Like we were able to do these things by wearing these, these clothes, right? Like it's a choice we made, um, the people in the poem made and it's been successful. But on the other hand, right, like it's, not the same successfulness for the reader, um, you know, in that they're experiencing deja vu in that consumption, 
right? So it is ironic, but it also seems to like transcend irony to what I'm calling like multidimensionality of perception, or as you use in the title, a, a prison. Um, you know, what are your goals in combining disparate procedures? Um, interrogating writing techniques through bizarre imagination and using hyper-specific images and actions. Well, uh, thank you for that reading. That was very, very flattering, very perceptive, I think. Uh, but um, no, it's, I think the first part of your question about um, combining rhyme or using rhyme in a, in, a, in, a, in a context of absurdity or absurd images or silly images. Um, I think I, I think rhyme has kind of naturally arisen out of the list problem. Like when I think of my, my, own, my own list poems and maybe all list poems, the, the list pre presents the problem of um, how, why do these need to be in this order? Why do, where, and when do we end? Why would we end? Um, and I think that rhyme is a way to argue for an order. It's a way to say to the reader, it's not just random. There's a, there's a pattern here. And it's like a, it's also a very naked pattern. It's not like trying to hide its, 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 its formal construction. It's trying to make the formal construction more blatant, which I, I think, that can lower the guard of the reader a little bit. Um, it's like, well, I understand that this is a rhyming poem. Okay, well, I, it's kind of removes a little of the, of the mystery so that the reader can maybe confront the content or, um, I don't know, it's almost like a, it's like a, a bait and switch where it's a rhyming poem that if it doesn't operate like a normal, like a usual rhyming poem you're expecting, um, it might catch you more off guard. So, feel like another thought about rhyme is that I like it because it's not, you're not supposed to do it um, in, 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 I think, serious poetry. Um, you know, we, I think most poets I know who are, you know, great poets who are great writers, they will acknowledge that rhyming is totally amazing when done well in the hands of, you know, the greats who have rhymed and can be done a well by anyone today. But in general, it's not like a thing that people should like or that um, it, it, it's often like associated with nursery rhymes or simplicity or Hallmark cards is a classic example. So it's kind of got this degraded reputation among the poets who am I might like respect and admire. Um, and even I hate poems that rhyme usually. So, but that makes it attractive to me to want to figure out how to use it. Um, like with any degraded form, like it, you know, a list is a, is another kind of like, oh, a list. It doesn't it doesn't ring with interesting. It doesn't. The word list is very mundane, and even rhyme I think comes off as quite mundane. So, I like taking these mundane things and trying to combine them with absurdity or, or provocative imagery, that makes you forget that they're mundane. And um, I think that can be an interesting experience for a reader. Um, and it, and as, as a writer who's uh, of many list of many long list poems, who's always searching for ways to organize those lists so that they feel um, really purposeful, even though you might not understand the purpose until you have experienced the poem many times, um, rhyme is really helpful. Um, without rhymes, I don't know why I would have put any line in any order in, in, especially in some of the sonnet sequences in this book. And um, I would just, I would be revising them to this day. Well, maybe this one could go here. Maybe that one could go here. So the rhyme gives me this artificial constraint that forces me to make a choice. If I commit to a rhyme scheme, um, I then have less choices. And it really helps me when I have a, this giant, you know, sack of images and, and I'm trying to figure out which ones to use and which not to use. Do you think it's it's necessary to make an argument for the order of the poem, like as the writer? Like you, you kind of mentioned, um, you know, end rhyme as, you know, showcasing that these lines are in an order 
and not kind of randomly placed on the page. I asked this kind of um, in respect to um, maybe the humor uh, in the work um, and what your thoughts are on writing humorous poetry. Like you spoke about the idea of putting poetry up on a pedestal, right? And like, it's this big and powerful thing and like no one understands it. And yet we're all trying to like get there, you know? Um, but like, where does humor fit in in that? And obviously there's plenty of, you know, popular examples that we could bring up, you know, someone like Chaucer, for example. Um, but like, do you think there is a lot of humor in poetry today? Um, or do you, or how do you see humor operating, you know, both in your work and maybe in poetry at large? Um, hmm. I think that when I was younger and I was able to be kind of funny, but nothing else, that was really the only thing I could bring to a poem of, of like to, 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 I guess, reward reading the poem. Um, I think that I did believe that there was somehow this deficit of humor in poetry and that I could, I could infuse it with more, a more lighthearted or uh, even anarchic um, kind of uh, spirit that I thought was missing from it. But I think that was, the, the older I got and the, the more I read, I slowly, slowly learned that humor was not missing in poetry and never really was in need of any kind of correction. It was just my own kind of myopia about my own special important world. I think once your own, like my own special importance in the world kind of gets uh, bloodied up or, you know, <laughs> abused enough to like kind of dispel itself, then, um, you can see, yeah, the, suddenly you're reading Chaucer and you're like, this guy's hilarious. It's unbelievably like, uh, so I think that it's an illusion that, poet, that poetry is missing humor and there's always enough humor in any form probably, but especially poetry. And so for me, that was an awakening and it helped me, I, I then tried to not be so obsessed with being funny or making jokes and like try to write serious poetry or non-funny poetry because the, the, nobody needs another guy like me making jokes in a poem. Um, but none of the quote serious or non-humorous or non-ironic poems that I ever wrote did I like. I never could, they just felt, false or fake to me. And that was like, that was another kind of learning experience where I, I so one day I stopped trying to write serious, you know, good looking, well-mannered lyrical meditations on stuff. And, um, and just decided that like, well, for me to enjoy writing it, for me to ever decide that I, I'm proud enough of it to publish it, it's probably gonna have to have some kind of ironic bite to it because that's just how I am, I guess. Um, and I like the idea of being extremely sittingly ironic and then also being extremely stupidly sentimental and putting them right next to each other or maybe one in one poem and one in the next and trying to even break out of that um, cycle or I'm comfortable in that cycle and I will try to break out of it, but um, but it, yeah, it, I, I like irony because it is, uh, it feels true to me and that you could say one thing and it can mean multiple things depending on how cynical or, um, or idealistic you feel in that moment. And that to me is kind of like how I feel about the world. I, I see one thing and if I'm cynical in a cynical mood, I see it, I see all these consequences of it that are, are awful or um, maybe true. And then I see the same thing in a better mood and I, I see the beauty in it. And so I like poetry or I'm only s capable of being satisfied by my own poetry to the extent that it embodies both. So what do you think? I always, I always kind of come back to this question myself, um, you know, asking myself like, why, 
why am I writing? Why am I writing poetry? You know, why do these things? Um, and like, I have answers, you know, uh, they change based on the day. They change based on, you know, things I think about and watch and whatever, see and talk to people. Like, what do you, what do you think uh, writing helps you do? Like you mentioned uh, earlier, you know, thinking through different processes and um, focusing and like understanding like the one thing. Um, do you like find that uh, you're interested in, right? Like taking in the world and kind of um, writing into like how you see things happening and, and how you understand them. Um, obviously, as you've said, maybe you don't set out to write, like I'm gonna write this poem, right? Um, but does, when you shift from writing a good line and then a second good line and then bringing in some of the other lines you have, um, are you like trying to direct uh, the poems into being something like that, like a response of some sort? Are you trying to listen to the poem tell you like, you know, here's what we're doing. Um, here's what makes this, um, you know, worthwhile and interesting. I don't know, it's kind of a confusing question, I think, but it's one that I like, I always think about um, considering that, you know, poetry was once this grand thing where we had, uh, you know, people uh, memorizing things and then reciting them uh, in crowds, for example. Um, and now, uh, I mean, I guess over time, you know, that kind of lessened and maybe it's coming back in some respects. Um, I don't know. I just, it's a continual thought that I have. <clears throat> Excuse me. No, it's, it's a great question. Um, I, I certainly wonder about that constantly. Uh, it's really, I think I could probably list, you know, 10 reasons why I write poetry and many of them would probably contradict, some reasons would contradict others. And, but I, I think it's, I think every poet ought to have a few reasons that they know well and they're different for everyone, but I think um, understanding why I write is a big part of, um, it was a big part of my own, like, I guess, learning curve. And I think a lot of people um, early on maybe don't interrogate enough why they wanna do it or why they enjoy it or what it's, what its social purpose is, what its private purpose is, what its um, cultural purpose is. Uh, so I don't, I think that we can all imagine answers to the question of what's the purpose of writing. Uh, so most importantly, I think, I think it's, it's helpful for writers to, for most writers to um, interrogate their own need or want to write poetry um, because the answers to the whys drive every other part of the process, in my opinion. Um, they change the way you might revise, the way you might um, set goals for yourself and then, you know, not care if you fall short of them or beat yourself up if you fall short of them, whatever they are. Um, and also it changes through time. So like, if you say to, if someone loves baseball or loves, you know, pro sports, okay, probably the reason they love it when they're 12 and then the reason they love it when they're 25 and the reason they love it when they're 60 is slightly different. Um, it's certainly different for me with like, I, I watch football. I don't, I don't, I do know why I love football, but sometimes I, I, I think it to myself, why do I like football? Um, and then the, the reason why it's changed over the years, it's certainly changed a lot. When I was a kid, I watched it. My dad watched it and my brother watched it. So like, what else am I? I can't not watch it. With I want to be like them. So it was very much social. And I wanted to participate. I wanted to be part of the community that, of the people that was surrounding me that loved me. Well, you know, years and years and years later, my parents are gone. And, and now I watch football because I, I just love that 
that feeling that if 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 they were still alive they'd be they'd be right here with me and we'd all be doing this and it's a so it's a bond it's absurd this absurd sport is a bond for me through the barrier of life and death with people I miss so poetry is no different than that for me um it's like a thing you take your time out of your life to to give to and um it connects me to people that I love. It um, it makes me feel like I'm in conversation with uh, the dead or um, people who are alive but I've never met, who I respect. And uh, you know, if I didn't have poetry, I wouldn't have access to that. Um, writing it and reading it. Um, it's also spiritual or religious to me. So there's like there's a million reasons why. Um, and I think it's always been like this. I don't, I, I'm really skeptical of any, any like, well, things used to be this, now they're that. And I, I know what you mean though, when you're saying like, truly poetry used to be one of the few, like sort of social art forms, you know, there weren't as many as there are now. And now there are way more, but I think that all the functions that poetry once served back in 12,000 BC, or whenever we discovered it, uh, are probably all still in effect today and never going to go away because it's the one form of art that is, um, uh, it's quite, it's, it's very elemental to conscience. As soon as you learn language, you can, you know, you know, I've got a, a son who's very young and he's just learning how to string sentences together and it's virtually indistinguishable from, you know, poetry written today by professional poets sometimes not because he's smart but because his he's learning to play with language at an elemental level which is what kind of poetry teaches you eventually to return to um so i hope that i hope that was a, some kind of answer yeah no i mean you know recently i've been thinking about i don't know i forget why i was thinking about this but like the idea of facts being like irrefutable, for example, um, like this is a fact and it will never change except that that's not ever the case, right? Like, and science itself proves that over and over by, you know, we once thought this was one thing and now it's this other thing. And I, I don't know, I find it like, I think I find it comforting to ask the question and think about the question, even if I know there's no, like, I can't nail down an answer and it's like that answer forever, right? Like there's something in the shifting uh, way that we approach, imagine, and, you know, write the thing, right? Like whatever the thing is. And so I kind of pulled that from left field just because it's like, I don't know, forefront in my mind, you know? Yeah, no, I think, I, I often have this, I, it's like, I feel like I'm often on the cusp of a really good metaphor for what makes poetry um, special among all the art forms. And I, I never can get it right, but it's like, uh, I think poetry is, because it is language, um, it's like it's a form you could just have in your brain you don't even have to say it out loud you could think a poem if you knew words and uh it's like it's the closest art form to consciousness it's like right right after consciousness you're capable of poetry and so uh, so few other forms of art are that close you have to have materials you have to be outside you have to you know buy this stuff and have this kind of studio or whatever or crew or whatever um and so i think of poetry as often it's like so hard to define because it's so close to who we are um and the language that we are socialized by the, the very thing that that is our ability to define poetry it's made up of the materials of poetry so it's so it's like a it's like a it's like a water trying to just figure out what water is you know i think i don't know that's that's my bad attempt at that. But <laughs> no, that's good. I think that's what makes it unique um, and like infinitely think aboutable, I right. guess. Well, speaking of think aboutability, 
Uh, let's look at this revision, uh, which becomes Prism Jugglers, the first poem in the book. All right, whenever you're ready. Okay, Prism Jugglers. Handcuffed skeletons washed ashore. We walked in sandals of cantaloupe rinds. We wore newspaper fedoras. We anointed stars the source of our laws. We drained cocktails across the sea through really long straws. We hid high, live doves in hollowed out Bibles. We shot cannonballs point blank into gongs. We juggled prisms, as you know. We were roosters paid not to crow. We binged watch sitcoms set in sweatshops. We finger painted our own Rorschach ink blots. We blinded each other by bouncing the sun off our meat cleavers. We played pianos whose keys were upturned human fingers. We shook human hair pom-poms at the fuckless moon. With poems in Sharpie on water balloon, we bombed the doomed. Our stovepipe hats prevented dementia. Our bowling shoes prevented mildew. Our clown shoes prevented hubris. Our crowns of thorns prevented deja vu. So that first line, I'm interested in the first line. Like the reason it stands out to me is besides the with poems and Sharpie line, it's the only one that's not a collective people, right? Either we or our. How, why did you, like if, you're, if your idea um, or like your idea of, you know, starting with one line and then like moving from there, uh, finding one good line, like how how do you find that one great line to like open a book and like why choose this one? It's a good, it's a great question. There's there's so many answers there. Um, I'll, the first one I'll start with is like there used to be another line there um, that was before that one, and it was like it was too fucked up. Uh, it was so like dramatically loud. I love the image and I'm not going to tell you what it is, but <laughs> it was, it was like, I, you know, handcuffed skeletons washing ashore is pretty bad. That's a, it's probably a, a horrible situation. Um, but, but it's like, it's almost narrated in this casual, if you're not paying attention, you might even just not consider the horror of what that implies. But the first image that I used to have there, there was no way to not see it. And I, I think it's, a, it's even a better image. Um, and a lot of, you know, some of my readers and editors, they really liked it and they were mad when I cut it. But I ended up cutting it because it immediately put the reader on alert that this is, we're talking about bad stuff here. And so by removing it, I feel like handcuffed skeletons washed ashore I wanted this poem to really indict the we, the me and the reader and everyone else who's in, who could, who even thinks they might be in the we, you know, I wanted it to be a kind of ringing, kind of like scathing bite into um, privilege or the way we, uh, the way there are really messed up problems around the world that we protect ourselves from and cut ourselves off from because we want to be free of them. We don't, we want to have no response ability of them. So I was really into opening with a with a horror that in that first line you don't know that you're part of it. But then you get to the we and it's like, oh, they're there these these skeletons are washing up on the shore and we're we're walking in cantaloupe sandals down the beach. And like there so that that really that big contrast I think would be um, not as good if it if I involved the we immediately. It's almost like I wanted to open a movie on a, on a horrific scene and then pan back to reveal that you are the one like, you know, staring at it, not some other stranger, not, not me, I'm not, I'm not there. I mean, if I'm there, you're there too. Um, so it was that kind of like a reveal of a, of a complicity idea. Um, but it's a quieter opening than it used to be. Um, but I think it's, I, I want it to be haunting at least a little bit. I think it's definitely haunting. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's uh, 
when I think about like returning the sword to the stone, like, right, like the myth of returning a sword to the stone, I'm not necessarily thinking about dead bodies, you know, right? Like, right, right. That have been dead for some time. Right. And somehow remain intact and wash up on shore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know what the story is that, that yields that image, but I do know that, that I do like images that imply this whole narrative that's off the, off the screen. Right. So like in a single moment, you, you can imagine a longer narrative that has a lot of more consequences. So, I mean, I think that that's one of the beautiful things that, you know, writing can do is like, you don't have to say much as long as it's something that people can see and like, or feel or, or whatever, they can fill in that space for you. And sure. I don't know, I think that's, that's one of the fun things about writing because what I think and what the next person thinks, they're not gonna be the same. Um, anyway. Earlier I mentioned velociraptors. You like velociraptors, I think or at least are interested right. in them. I, I bring this up because, you know, you, you do engage with pop culture um, pretty closely in a lot of your work, I think. And I wonder like what you see yourself as, like, do you feel like, you know, you're a pop artist? Do you feel like, you're a writer. Do you feel like, um, you know, you're a spirit sent from like the past to write about the future? Like, I don't know. Like, how do you like picture yourself um, when you're you're Mark Leitner and you're the only one awake in your house and you're like, this is what I'm doing. Outside of your family, a... obviously. You know. <laughs> right. Right. Um... Well, I do think that the, the I don't think of myself, I think most writers would probably agree with me and say, I don't like labels and I don't try to find one that fits so that I can like be that. Um, but so I, I definitely don't think I'm a pop artist or I think writer is my preferred label because it's vague enough to keep me kind of free to do whatever I want. Um, but with regard to pop culture references specifically, I kind of have, you know, I, I don't like a lot of pop culture references in poetry, but I definitely include them in my own, which is weirdly hypocritical of me, but, um, I do try to, I do have like some rules that I try to follow, like, um, like Velociraptors, Jurassic Park, to me, that is a... <laughs> You know, I would I would never include Marvel characters in my poems because I don't like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's not interesting to me. I don't. That's not an opinion that is. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't even know if I'm right in that opinion. I just don't like them. Other people can like them. Maybe they're great, and I definitely have watched my fair share. But I'm not interested in them. They don't mean enough to me when I think about. But when I think about dinosaurs, that goes deep into my consciousness. And, um, and so I'm more comfortable talking about Jurassic Park than, than that stuff. I also think Jurassic Park is a great movie. It's every time I rewatch it, I've probably seen it 50 times. Every time I watch it, I see something new that I didn't see before. So that's not the case with other stories. And so... If a, if a movie I've seen it enough times that I really see infinite things in it, then I say it's, it's cleared the bar and I can include it in my poetry because I don't think it's disposable or as disposable. Um, and I also think it's silly and it's not, you're not supposed to, I like that no, no, I like that you're not supposed to write about pop culture so that I can try to do it and maybe catch some people off guard or, or catch myself off guard really. Um, but 
I don't, how do I think of myself? That's a harder question. And I, I try to think of it more practically than that. I, I'm like, did I make my, did I meet my deadline for this project? Am I going to finish this book that I'm currently working on that I've been saying I'm going to finish and not flake out on? And did I do the step that I need to do today to get there? That is like, that's as far as I think in terms of writerly identity. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think I generally agree with you um, in that, you know, a lot of writers, you know, we hate like the label, we hate, um, and like, that's why I ask you the question, like, because I'm so, uh, you know, it's like we're so into what we are or we aren't that like it's it's interesting to have someone else think about it um to like reaffirm something we've thought right totally and um you know i think uh the whole the whole process is really interesting in that everyone that writes kind of writes differently and they have different like you have rules uh, for your writing, like Velociraptors uh, make the cut and like the Hulk's down here and he's never making the cut, right? But, uh, you know, I think there's, what you're talking about earlier with like poetry being like so close to consciousness, it's, it's somehow like organic um, in a way that is um, both easy and impossible to harness. Um, and, you know, I think this whole thinking about anything to do with writing proves useful in that, like, later today, I'll probably come back to something we discussed and like, you know, think about it and something will happen. I don't know if something good will happen, you know, just something will happen. So. Um, no, I, that, that, that does make sense. I, I think it's a good question. It is, and you know, I feel like in this answer, I'm trying to be my best self. Like I, I'm going to pretend like I don't care about labels and, you know, I, I, I'm not pretending, but in my other versions of my day and I might be like, Oh, I want to be one of those guys, or I, I want to be like this, or I'll see some random like sci-fi author's website whose books I love. And I'll be like, Oh my gosh, they're so consistent. They're so consistently a sci-fi writer that's their identity. They don't question it. They don't write books outside of that genre, messing up whole ability to market their own books. Like, oh, I'm so jealous. Like, I'll get jealous of that. And then, you know, so it's not like I'm somehow above that, that desire to be underneath an accurate label. But I, I think the mature, like adult version of me is like, labels don't matter you write what you write if it feels true to you and you let who cares about like if labels are applied to you that's out of your control and let let the chips fall wherever they fall but all anyway. right yeah well you know thank you so much for joining us today um you can get mark's uh, book with phonograph editions um and uh, we hope to see more work of various kinds in the future Thank you, Matthew. I really, I really enjoyed talking with you. Um, take care. All right, you too.